Welcome to The Altitude Show. I'm your host, Dave Brinker. Will Primos is a friend of mine, an entrepreneurial genius, and best known as the founder of Primos Hunting, which became one of the top selling hunting brands in the United States. He obviously has lots of hunting adventures to talk about, which you can find lots of other places. But in this episode, we decided to go a different direction, from the meaning of life, to which books to read, to his family's history in the restaurant business. We were all over the map in deep conversation, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Check it out. The Altitude Show is brought to you by Peaks Equipment, the world's leading technical, hard goods, and accessories brand for backcountry enthusiasts. From trekking poles, to headlamps, to best-in-class gators, Peaks delivers a system of products that work to achieve optimal performance in the harshest conditions. Don't suffer on your hunting adventures. Peaks enables you to thrive on the mountain when everyone else is going home. Visit peaksequipment.com and use code ALTITUDE for 10% off today. That's ALTITUDE for 10% off on peaksequipment.com. Outdoor Class is the new source of premium outdoor education from trusted and knowledgeable experts. For hunters committed to improving their skills, Outdoor Class is the only subscription-based e-learning platform that provides unlimited access to video lessons from the world's most respected experts. Learn from industry leaders like Corey Jacobson, Randy Newberg, Remy Warren, and other experts across all the topics that affect you as a hunter. Make sure to follow Outdoor Class Official on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and take your game to the next level by going to OutdoorClass.com. That's OutdoorClass.com. Welcome, Will. Thank you, David. You know, I haven't hadn't seen you in a couple of years, and you moved back to Oregon, and uh, I hope things are going well for you there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I'm constantly reminded of the amazing experience that you uh, shared with me down in Mississippi. I don't know. That must have been six, seven, eight years ago at this time at, R- at Rivers Run. Man, that place, yeah. whew, that place was amazing. Well, thank you. Um, I have since sold it. Yeah. Um, since I sold my company, and uh, Jimmy and I sold in 2000, Jimmy Primos, my cousin, sold Primos in 2006. And as you know, all those early years at Rivers Run was incredible as we entertained everybody in the hunting industry and got to have break bread with them and, and experience that beautiful part of the Mississippi alluvial floodplain in the Mississippi Delta. Um, you know, whether it be Cabela's or Bass Pro or Dick's or Academy, I mean, it just goes on and on and, 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 and yourself with Sitka and, uh, just to get to know those people and to connect on a level that had a common interest in hunting, but there's so much more I learned from those people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, as I've told you before, I, I, uh, I grew up as many kids did watching, uh, your company blossom actually your company blossom far be- probably actually before i was born but <laughs> uh, but uh you know the the whole you were one of the godfathers of creating content and delivering it to uh people that love hunting and uh you know obviously we'll talk a lot about primos and i'm sure some about hunting but more of what i i really wanted to talk about today is uh you know kind of starting at the beginning of your story i think your story is fascinating um, and for, I'm just going to give a couple tidbits just to get the con- conversation rolling. Um, but, and obviously you can take it cause you're the one that lived it, but you, <laughs> you, you grew up in the South and yeah. your family owned a restaurant, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes. My grandfather on my daddy's side immigrated at eight years old with his mother and four siblings from Greece and landed in New Orleans. That was in 1908. And, um, you know, he's educated a third grade education in Greece, but didn't really know anything, you know, about the English language or work in here or whatever. So what do you do? He became a busboy in a restaurant at a very young age and he learned to wait on tables and he learned to cook and he learned to bake bread. And and he was an entrepreneurial spirit and he really built quite uh, an interesting little empire. Um, sent all his children to college. Uh, every one of them served in World War One or the Korean War. My daddy is still living. He's 97. He's a World War uh, II vet. He was a navigator on B-24s in the Pacific. 
Wow. Uh, and there's a lot more to that story, but <clears throat> uh, it, it goes on and on. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I, I didn't know that. So how, how long was he in the service and how long did he serve overseas? I, I'm not sure how, how long total, but I would say it was probably around five or six years. What do you think drove all the, it sounds like, so your grandfather had just, just boys or boys and girls? Well, he had one girl yeah. and four boys. My granddaddy okay. did. <clears throat> uh-huh. Um, the, the, uh, there was a, there was a war over there in Europe and Greece and they had taken my grandfather, my, my grandfather's father's land uh-huh. and killed him. And so his mother, my great grandmother, Yaya, um, brought them over. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I actually, she, he ended up, my granddad ended up buying property outside of Jackson. Uh, he bought, I don't know, a couple hundred acres reserved about 50 of it for the family only. And every aunt and uncle lived a quarter mile on that 50 acres. And even my great grandmother lived there. So I had an extended family. I had a very nurtured, protected, sheltered life growing up. All I did was hunt and fish and go to school. Uh, I was, I was one naive little kid. (laughs) But it it, it seemed, I mean, obviously that, that entrepreneurial spirit that your, your granddaddy had, Oh yeah, uh, made its way to your father and ultimately to you. How'd that happen? Well, my granddaddy was a big part of my life. His his name he was a- Angelo. We called him Pop, and um, the work ethic was tremendous. You just you didn't sit on your butt. You did not. And we had we had uh, two TV stations back then when I was growing up, and you were allowed to watch thirty minutes of television a day, and after that you were supposed to be doing homework or working. Um, there was always something to do. There was grass to cut. When you got big enough, the tra- you had to drive the tractor to cut the grass. There was ditches to clear. There, there was work to do in the restaurants. And after Sunday, after Sunday uh, church on Sundays, we were at the restaurant. And I was standing on back then. The Coke and Seven Up cases were wooden, and you would stack those so I'd be tall enough, and I'd sit there and make the teas for the waitresses when they call that three teas, you know, and you'd have to fix mm-hmm. them or, or three salads, and you'd fix the salads and the teas and. You are, you are, you grew up working. You grew up with a work ethic. Do you think uh, so? Obviously, work work ethics super important. But what other seeds did, did they plant? Uh, like, just did they? Like you said, you lived a pretty sheltered life. Expand on that. Did they? Did your granddaddy and 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 your parents? Did they want you to have more, or were they like, you know what? This is just what it is. You 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 live here in outside of Jackson on the family farm, and you're going to work your whole life. Or how how did that look? Well, we were encouraged. Number one, we it was required that we make certain grades and that we do their homework, and they were very involved with the teachers, going to the schools, knowing what was going on. And if I did something in school that was wrong, and I got back then, you got punished. You got you got whipped for it. And if I got if I got my butt popped in school, when I got home, my parents already knew about it, and I got my butt whipped again. <laughs> and you I mean know, I, and you mean literally whipped back in those days? I mean I mean <laughs> literally whipped. I mean I don't know I don't know when it got started, but I have seen and met parents who found out their children got disciplined in school, which whatever fashion they got disciplined, and the parents would go up there and chew the teacher out in school. Mm-hmm. that wasn't the case when I grew up. When I, when I grew up, the teacher was right. And, and that was it. You didn't, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can tell you one, I can tell you one story yes, please. Uh, about my daddy um, actually in the seventh grade going to school to confront the teacher. And that was a very traumatic, big deal. And it was incredible that my daddy went to school. The point I think that needs to be made here is the involvement of my parents in our lives. My daddy worked all the time, but he knew, he, I knew that he loved me and I knew that my mother loved me. We were strongly disciplined. Uh, we were, went to church. We, we, I mean, that, uh, understanding your salvation, understanding who Jesus Christ was. I'm a Christian and it's not a light, thing when i say that it's, it's a very serious thing it's the center and the grounding of my whole life um and it, it's not some 
mystical, whatever. It's a very simple deal. And the deal is, I believe that that's all there is to it. Um, I just I just believe. So it's, it's a very simple thing. It's, it's, it's just simple. And I believe don't try to make it complicated. I'm not going to try to answer everything. I do not know everything. I'm not perfect. But I just believe and I pray to the Lord every day. My prayers are pretty darn simple. I ask for things. I thank him for things. I tell him how much I appreciate his grace and, and, and the wonderment of the world that he allowed me to become a part of. And I thank him for my parents. And I feel almost guilty because I had such incredible loving parents. There are people out there that did not have incredible loving parents. There are people out there that didn't even have parents. And I feel like that I should give back. And I feel like that I should, I should do my part. And that's what I call it. I call it doing my part to always take the time to look at somebody in the eyes and hear their story. And it, it can't all be about me. And it's about me a lot of the time. So when you create a company and you're in front of the public and you're on TV all the time, it, it, I never wanted to be a hunting hero. And it, it came with the territory. But back to my parents. I told my daddy, <clears throat> oh, it's probably been 30 years ago. I said, daddy, somebody asked me what my greatest gift in life was. And I want you, to, I want to tell you my answer. And he says, okay. I said, the greatest gift in my life was my father's love for my mother. Mm. I, I cannot tell you how important the family is for this country, for the world. Just looking, looking at you and your children and being, being around you when they were being born and going in and out of Bozeman and getting to have dinner with you and your wife and seeing the love in your eyes and there as and seeing that they're going to nurture and love these children. They're going to protect them. Mm -hmm. And I hope that they're going to discipline them because that is a huge part of what makes us or breaks us. There is right and wrong. And you have to understand that. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. Do you think some of that's been lost in, in the current times? It seems like, you know, uh, and I have three kids, as Will, Will mentioned, most of you know. Um, and obviously, they're the most important thing in my, in my life, in my wife's life. Um, and I, I believe just from my own personal experience that if you can do a good job loving them and showing them that you support them and love them and also loving your wife or your husband or your partner, uh, you, you ultimately have the highest odds of raising good humans, it seems like. And it yeah. seems, but it also seems like that's not as respected as it used to be. Yeah, it isn't. Um, I, I, I don't know why. I don't know why it changed. I don't know why it's like that. I don't know. Um, I, I, ain't, I don't. I don't know. I wish I. I wish I did understand it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, back back to the the parents and what what made me and mm -hmm. um, I mean, I knew I was going to college. That my daddy saved every nickel and penny to make sure he could send his kids to college. So I knew when I graduated from high school, I'm going to college. Um, I didn't really want to go to college. Um, th those were very difficult times. Um, that was the Vietnam war. It was in its height in my later, uh, latter years of high school. My draft number was not too big. And I think that was a huge downfall of this country. Uh, I think everyone should be required to serve. And the fact that it's a volunteer army is, is a, is a problem because mm -hmm. you don't have any skin in the game. If you don't have any skin in the game, you don't appreciate what others have done for you. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from uh, high school in 1970, I went to the Air National Guard and the Air Force. I did not want to go to Vietnam. At that point, at that time, it was known fact uh, on the Huntley Brinkley Show and the other uh, TV news programs at the time, that the United States was not in it to win it, that it was a political nightmare. Yeah. So many lives have been given up and sacrificed and it's atrocious. War is atrocious. 
And I'll, I'll, I'll give my life for my country, but I wasn't going to do it under those circumstances. So I joined the Air National Guard and I got tapped to be a marksmanship instructor. Well, that fit right down my alley because just being outside and hunting was my game. And so <laughs> I went to Lackland Air Force Base and I trained to be a marksmanship instructor. I was number one in my class. No wonder you're such a good shot. <laughs> I'm not always a good job. But anyway, I was number one in the class, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I, I learned how to take care of small arms and train the officers uh, how, how to go about protecting themselves if they got shot down. Um, but li life wouldn't, wasn't that easy. I mean, I, there, I, I made mistakes. I made bad choices. Uh, but I can tell you this much. I always knew who was going to be there to pick me up. And that was my parents. Mm. My mother has prayed for me. She is 95 years old <laughs> and she has prayed for me every day of my life. And I'm, wow. I'm, I'll be, I'll be 70 in a week. And, and she, she, um, she never, she's never, even before I was conceived, she was praying for me. <laughs> and that's the kind of woman that she is. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of man my daddy is. And, and, um, man, to see them, together at 97 and 95 holding on to each other and loving each other they've been married 73 years it's pretty Holy incredible moly it's a, it's a it's a wonderful thing and it's a wonderful heritage uh but that is a, that's a big part of what made me and the encouragement from my daddy back to them again so when i was growing up i was told by my daddy you can do anything you want to do if you want to become we had five restaurants if you want to Go, be into the family restaurant business. We can try to make a place for you. You'll have to earn that place, but you can do anything you want to do, anything you want to study. I've got so much money to send you to college. And if it goes past that, we'll figure something out, but you can do anything you set your mind to. And I've learned hmm. that as you go through life and you become passionate about something, never, ever underestimate somebody with passion. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you this, my competitors in my little world I lived in, in the hunting products business, my competitors underestimated me. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 would, I can share that sentiment as, as someone who's spent a lot less time in the industry than you have. But um, I, I mean, I'm a great example of that. I always talk, remind my wife that I got a 1.87 in high school. <laughs> and, okay, explain. And I, and I don't, well, it was mostly because I was more interested in beer and girls. Uh, but imagine that I yeah. was too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point of it is, is I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not the book, most book smart person. And the reason that I've been able to have the success in the hunting industry that I have is because I'm passionate about it and I'm going to do anything that it takes to, to, to work hard and, and, and be successful. And I figure it out. And I'm also not scared of failure, but I'm interested to know, um, Okay, so you, you're this is the seventy early seventies, right? Yeah. Yep. And you're you're a man of faith. You grew up in a very strong, loving household, uh, yep. strong family. You got half a dozen restaurants, um, and you're but you're also an avid uh, outdoorsman. It sounded like, and because that was kind of yep. your escape, similar to my story. Um, yep. And uh, so, what made you sort of what what was the trigger that made you go? I don't know if the restaurant business is for me or not. Well, I knew that early on. Okay. Uh, I, I, got, I graduated from, uh, from school, from college in 1974, and I had a business degree. I minored in biology. I, I didn't really have a choice. I, I mean, all of a sudden, I'm the, I'm the little birdie that's getting kicked out of the nest, and I had to figure out how to fly. Mm. Uh, I wasn't, I, I'd worked all through college in different part-time jobs. I worked on a farm for a while. I worked for my daddy for a while, trying to supplement my income from my, from my habits. I had bad habits. Hunting habits are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta go have some extra income somewhere. So, yeah. you know, one thing led to another and I just didn't have a choice. Uh, I had decided I'd check dating a girl and, and got married and uh, I had to earn a living. So I, I went to work for the family. We had one restaurant that was very large, had 13 banquet rooms in it. it was what type only, of food? I'm just curious. What, what, what was the restaurant like? So the, it was, it was a, a steak, Greek seafood that had a lot of Greek flair, Greek salads, oh, wow. a lot of Greek flair from my, from my granddaddy. And it had a, yeah. big, a big bakery that supplied all the baked goods and all the breads for all the restaurants. So they uh -huh. were trucks 
between the different restaurants. Um, but anyway, one thing led to another. The, the marriage was not successful. It, it was it was not good. Um, mm. And that fell apart. And in I had started my game call company in 1976. And I, you know, it, it was K and the Cain. But one time, uh, very early on, 1975, really, I built all these calls all year. Then 76 um, and 75, I went to a show and I took my calls with me. And I had a little outdoor show, you know, your little outdoor expo. And I sold $1,800 worth of turkey mouth calls. That's all Whoa. I was making at the time. And I went, holy moly, I might be able to get out of the restaurant <laughs> business if I can keep doing this. I, I, because the restaurant business was very confining. And it, we had yeah. seven-day-a-week a operations. And so it was, it was just extremely confining. And I just didn't feel like that was for me. So one thing led to another. Um, I, I had the company, built the company, kept 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 never taking money out, just kept trying, kept going all of my vacation time was trying to do that. And so one thing led to another, uh, ended up, uh, divorced. And my daddy introduced me to a lady, Mary, who's, who you've met, who's yes. my bride. We've been we married 32 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, she, she'd been the biggest supporter and everything turned around, uh, for me, cause I was at a low point in my life. And uh, I decided we, we I decided we were going to build the I was going to build the company and she was going to support me. She had a she was a big radio executive for uh, five FM radio stations, uh, set, selling national uh, ads. And anyway, so one thing well, led to another, and that's what opened the door was finding Mary and putting her in my life. Well, uh, that's awesome. What uh, what was your goal like when you decided to go on this out in the entrepreneurial world head first, like? I talk to a lot of people that never take that leap because of their, they live in a perpetual state of fear. Did you feel yeah. that? Did you feel the same fear everybody else does and just decide to go against? Oh, oh yeah. I felt the okay. fear, but, but there's a part of me that's the risk taker, but mm-hmm. it's a, it, it's a calculated risk. So every risk is calculated and I would take a decision and put it in my head. Like that was going to be the decision. And I would anticipate my brain would just fly around anticipating if I do that and this happens and this happens and what, what, and, and there's always the, the things you don't know that are going to happen. You have no clue. So you do the best you can, but you turn, you take turns as you go down the road. Uh, so it, it, it was a leap of faith, but it was also the only way for me. Mm. I, I had, I didn't have anything. I didn't have the ability to fall on something. I think if I had, I would have fallen on it and would have never become anything. So you didn't have, you didn't have a backup plan. Well, there was no backup. There was no bed to fall on. There was no, Mm -hmm. there was no, if the, if the parachute didn't open, I'm done. Yep. Uh, You know, so, so the point I'm trying to make is, is that I just had to go for it. Mm. And, and with Mary's support and I wasn't drawing a salary from the company and we just built and built and built. And I call it a flywheel. We built the flywheel so big and so heavy that it's moving fairly slow, but it's turning and it's going to take a big, big something to stop it. Mm. It it, it gets to rolling. And once you get it rolling, you feel that momentum. But I'm, I I was a business major, but I had natural built God given uh, skills to recognize things about business. So I was extremely demanding, but I built uh, along with others help, uh, a, a performance review system. Every at one point we had 260 employees. Every every employee got a performance review every three months. Three months. Yes. Woo, and you're tough, and, Will. And, and, and there were seven uh, departments, seven different executives in the company that had uh, middle management under them, and it was a, it was a, it was a uh, tiered operation, and everything flowed up. And I looked at every performance review because if they weren't given properly if they weren't given with the goal of being all you could be for that employee and helping that employee gain their place in life and if you didn't have that attitude then you weren't going to succeed in getting that person to be on the right seat on the bus i remember i was looking at the performance reviews one time and it came across my desk and this was a middle management guy giving a uh, uh, somebody a performance review an hourly person and it's, it said uh 
what what goals do, does the person need to work toward? And the guy wrote down, "You need to do better." <laughs> no, okay. So I called him in there he's, and um, sat him down and I said, so I got this performance for you. I appreciate you getting them done on time. I know it's a labor. It's every three months and you turn your back and it's coming around again. And I said, I appreciate it very much, but I want to help you with this because if I was to give you this performance review, you wouldn't know where to go because telling somebody they need to do better. is not a roadmap. <laughs> no. And I explained it to him and I taught him and I made him a better supervisor. So I said, I want you to re-give this performance review to this person, and I want you to give them specific directions. Let's talk about that. And the directions were come in on time. Call if you're going to be out that day. You know, in other words, be responsible. There were just specific things this person wasn't doing. Give them some direction. So that's one thing. But having a, having a, a manual, a company manual that's spelled out for everybody, having a mission statement hmm. and understanding the mission statement. And we what redid the, them. What was the mission statement back then? Do you remember it? Uh, well, the, a mission statement is typically a one uh, sentence or two sentence mm -hmm. line, it, very focused. And uh, to a lot of companies, they don't really spend enough time on it and it doesn't really give direction. Mm -hmm. Our mission statement was that we're all about the, the success of our dealers selling Fremo's product. Hmm. That was the mission. When you pulled into the, the complex, 110,000 square foot building, there was a big, huge molded concrete sign that said dealer support center. Back then, the distribution was different than it is now. Right. There's not the internet and that kind of thing. So it was all a yeah. three-step three -step system. You had a distributor, you had a dealer and a consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you wanted to get to that dealer, because he was the one selling the consumer. And so we focused on that. And, and, and I read, I read all the time. I'm, I'm reading. You see me, I got a book somewhere. I'm reading. I, I, I might not read it, but 10 minutes here and some, some I exercise every morning. I spend a lot of time doing that, but books can open your eyes. I told you my daddy was a navigator in the Pacific, uh, 1945, 44, 45. And, um, I read this book. A guy told me recently, he said, you got to read this book. I'm like, okay. So I read this book. It was called Unbroken. And it's by Louis Zamperini, who was an Italian boy born in California, who, who had a natural ability to run, became an Olympic contender, went to Germany, ran in the Olympics, met Hitler, met the head of his Gestapo, what was his name, Goebel, Whatever his, I forget, I forget what his name was. And uh, it's an incredible story. His plane crashed in the Pacific. He floated longer on a raft than any man has ever been recorded floating. Ended up being captured by the Japanese and was tortured. And it's his story and how he ended up on that raft and telling the Lord, if he got him off that raft, he'd devote his life to him. He went through the torture. He went through the hell of Japanese imprisonment. Got back home. And there was one man called the Birdman. And the Birdman tortured him every day. He knew he was an Olympic champion. And he tortured him. He physically beat the crap out of him every day. And so Louis would wake up at night in sweats it was with, a, with things in his hand. It, it was always in his mind. He was strangling the bird man. And he, he, he was an alcoholic wreck. Met a girl. They got married. That was falling apart. That was going south real quickly. One thing led to another. And he was in the right place at the right time. And the Lord tapped on him and said, remember that prayer? And he remembered the prayer. And he devoted his life to God and became a Christian and never, ever had another nightmare and built a school for kids and helped kids who had no fathers, who had nothing and devoted his life to them. And it's, it's, it's one of the most beautiful, incredible stories. But you learn stuff about the character of a country and how that country got created. So the book Unbroken is I'm write that down. It, 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 it's, it's, it's fascinating, unbelievable. Well, I got rid of, I got rid of reading that book 
And the same guy said, okay, you got to read Flyboys. I went, okay. I went and bought Flyboys. Oh, my gosh. Same time, same deal. The Flyboys, George, uh, old man George Bush, got shot down as one of the Flyboys. They were the boys. They were the country boys. They were the boys like George Bush who had privilege, who ended up be, going to war and learning how to fly. And they were the Flyboys were responsible for taking Chichijima, a little teeny tiny small island in the Pacific. Uh, and he, George Bush got shot down, but he got picked up by a submarine. He got very, very, very lucky because the other Flyboys got captured by the Japanese, tortured, beheaded, and eaten. The Japanese were cannibals. People don't know that the culture of japan at the time and what was going on they would kill them cut them open take out their livers and serve it to the officers it's, it's, it's the most incredible it, it'll make you sick i got chills right now just thinking about it but what you learn from that is you learn from the character and from what's been done i'm working on a talk that i've got to give fly boys I'm going to write that down too. Oh, I'm telling you. I got more if you want them. It's unbelievable. My wife's so, going to thank you for making me read more. Oh, yeah. You got to read. You <laughs> got to You got to read because it's going to open doors for you that would have never, ever been opened because you're going to be able to walk, walk the road with people who have gone before you. Hmm. But anyway, so talking about history. So I, I looked this stuff up to, because I, I, I could remember it, but I couldn't remember it perfectly. I looked up these these thoughts uh, to express uh, history. This is credited to a guy named Edmund Burke. He was an Irish statesman. But the, the history, the, the, the documentation, things like it's a little misquoted because there, he's credited with having probably said those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. Mm. But the Spanish philosopher George Santayana is credited with the aphorism those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Hmm. British statesman Winston Churchill wrote, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Some I'm, pretty, I'm, pr pretty influential people there, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so talking about reading, I'm, I'm reading a book right, right now um, called With Winning in Mind. Hmm. And... It's, it's Lanny Bassam's book, B-A-S-S-H-A-M. And he was a runt of a kid who couldn't excel at anything. And that became a driving force for him. And he found out he could shoot a rifle. And he ended up being the Olympic world champion. Oh, wow. And he wrote this. If you don't think you can be successful, you won't be. Henry Ford said it best. If you think you can or can't, you're right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty so, amazing. All these things are from reading, and 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 it's, so you learn from what others have thought, and you 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 shouldn't take everything you read as the gospel. You should take it as an opportunity to to think about it for yourself. It can reinforce what you're already doing. It can teach you something new that you're not doing. It can help you to plan and it can help you anticipate what you didn't even would have never thought about. Uh, the marketing behind Primo's, I, I give uh, Trout and Rifkin, two, two famous marketers, a lot of credit because their books energized me and encouraged me to, and told me where I was going and where I hadn't thought about going that I could go. Well, that was one thing I wanted to ask you about because um, obviously – for those that don't know, my background is in marketing and brand. And as I mentioned earlier in the in the in the conversation, uh, Will and Primos, in my opinion, were so uh, such visionaries behind uh, how to deliver content to a market. I was reading last night about you, Will, and I actually didn't know this part, and it may or may not be true. You know, the internet. So tell me if this is fake news. Uh -huh. But but. Uh, Sometime, I don't know if it was in the early 80s or what, but it doesn't really matter. You started recording audio tapes on how you can call turkeys, right? And maybe ducks, too. Um, but uh, 
I, I made a duck call, but turkeys is what I recorded. Yeah, yeah. So, but not only that, you you at least talked about recording actual hunts, just audio, where people can listen to you hunting turkeys, calling them coming in, you shooting, whatever. Um, and I was thinking, man. So if you look at where we are today from a content delivery mechanism perspective, we have things like Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and all these things where we're basically delivering uh, the, the the actual structure of the content that's that that we're delivering isn't that much different than what you guys had already thought of in the eighters. It's just the 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 mechanisms for delivering it are, uh, were different. I mean, the value of giving free information giving information to people to help them be more successful has never changed. And you guys were like, Hey, I mean, right now we have audio tapes. That's what we have at our disposal. This is before, you know, hunting TV and all these other things. It's like, so we're going to fricking let's record some audio tapes and deliver them. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's kind of what per started to like open an, the aperture of Primos and really start accelerating it. Cause it pr yeah. ultimately, ultimately led to, you know, you guys being the, again, the basically the founders of uh, cr creating video content in the field and yeah. delivering it to the consumer. Yeah. So there's a book called Radical Marketing. And two of the companies that it talks about in there that I'm remembering right off, remembering right off hand right now, one's the Grateful Dead and one's Harley Davidson. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how these two organizations went about branding themselves and connecting to their consumer. And I read that after I'd started doing some things, but what it did for me, it reinforced how, if you read our mission statement, back to that, I told you about the one line on the mission statement. Well, the yeah. mission statement needed to be supported by several things. So there is a, a, a list of priorities and a list of goals under that mission statement on how each employee is to support that mission statement. I don't want to tell you how to go down the road. Okay. So back to radical marketing. So <clears throat> here I am trying to figure it out. Got this little company. I have no money. I can't afford an advertisement <laughs> in the new up and coming young national wild Turkey Federation magazine or ducks unlimited or anything else for that matter. But what do you do? He said, if I could find some way to create a product that would also be a profit generator mm -hmm. and then dead gum it. Ben Rogers Lee was a famous turkey hunter and he was a little bit before my time and he created an audio cassette. Well, I personally didn't think much about the audio cassette. I thought it was pretty poorly done, very poorly edited and loved Ben Lee. I met him and liked Ben Lee a lot, but I just wasn't think, didn't think much of the project. I can do better. So I hired a guy, took him to the woods with this Swedish Niagara recorder, big, huge monster thing that he had to open up and put the wheels on there. So that was the technology. We didn't have the digital we have today. This would have been about 1981 or two. And uh, he recorded me killing, calling up and killing redbird singing, turkey goblin, me getting him to fly down or him flying down and me calling him up, killing him, going to him, turkey flopping the whole bit. And we put that it, there. It was unbelievable. It was like it was like people were just going nuts over them. I ordered a thousand audio tapes from Hyatt. No wonder am I ever going to sell these. But dead gummit, we sold out of those and bought more and more. Well, there's a book, another book. Uh oh, I got a whole, I got a big list going here. Will okay. Name of this book is The Outliers. <laughs> yeah, I've read that one. Okay, I don't have to write that one down. Yes. By, by, Ma by Malcolm Gladwell. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what a great, great documentation and story about when you were born, the, the, the decade, the century, what was available to you that wouldn't have been available at any other time. A perfect example would be Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs would be another one, the Rockefellers. Uh, th th there's just so many that couldn't have done what they did if they hadn't been born when they were. Well, a guy gave me that book because he said, Will, you're an outlier. I went, huh? I read the book. I, 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 I see where he's coming from. Compliment taken, I guess. But uh, the audio cassette, if I hadn't been born when I did and the audio cassette hadn't become available, I would have never been able to do what I did to reach the people and to connect with them. So I realized I was connecting. I didn't care if you bought something or not. I cared if you. It, 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 so it went with the territory kind of deal. I, I cared that you learned and became passionate and wanted to protect the wild places and, and the places that these wild critters call home. 
And if I could do that and sell something in the process, so be it. If I couldn't, I'd have to find something else to do. Mm-hmm. Well, it worked. And it, you connected and you, 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 you had a relationship with your crowd, with your, with your customers. Then the audio cassette went away. They created this <laughs> stupid thing called uh, a CD. <laughs> we had to change that world. And so we had, so it, before that was the uh, VHS and we had, oh man, we, 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 we built these tapes and we just went and did it and called it the truth because everything just, we mm-hmm. didn't edit stuff out that was, that was bad. We, mm-hmm. we showed it like it was. We all mm-hmm. learned from watching it and that went away and <laughs> holy crud, it became DVDs. I had one customer call me and chewing me out saying, you quit making VHSs. I said, yes, or <laughs> nobody's buying them. And he goes, well, I've got a VHS player. I don't have a DVD player and I ain't buying a DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's change and change is going to happen. You yeah. better get ready. If, if you don't think it is, it's, it's going to happen. But, but it's, anyway, really, it's really interesting how you, and uh, I have so many questions, but, but, but how you kind of caught on to the fact that just, and it seems like naturally from a, like you said, you kind of had this natural talent for business where you caught on to the fact that it's like a lot of people will figure out how something works. It works, it works, it works. But then the, the technology changes and the world moves on and they can't get out of their rut and, and they won't let go of it. They, they try to polish a piece of crap forever and yeah. then eventually they sizzle out. But you yeah. seem to have the foresight and the vision, which I think is, in my opinion, one of the reasons you're such a successful person to go. You have the uh, humility to go, you guys, audio tapes were great. They got us to this point, but listen to me. I don't like CDs either. I think they're stupid, but we got to do them. <laughs> and then, you right. know, and then the same thing happens when social media comes along. I'm, I'm assuming, you know. So, but you have yeah. that. You have the discipline to be able to go. You know what? That worked great, but you guys, we got to rethink this. Yeah. Well, I have shied away. Uh, not shied away. I never went to social media. Yeah. I don't have a social media account. I don't have a a, a, a chicken do or whatever you call it. <laughs> or, a, or Instagram <laughs> or, or a Facebook page. The Primo's company has a Facebook page mm-hmm. and they put me on there and people call me and tell me, did you see yourself on there? I says, Nope, I ain't never, I ain't never, I've never been to it. And it's almost become a, a kind of a, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I don't, I don't ever go to that's it. discipline. Will. well, well, discipline's another big part of life, buddy. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll tell you about, I'll tell you about this right. in a minute, All right. in a All minute. Right. but, but anyway, so, so, I, maybe I'm wrong because I haven't embraced it. And let, let me go back to why. Yeah. I was about to embrace it. And at my farm, there's a certain deer that lived. His name was Eric. He's named after the first guy that ever saw him on the hoof. We had pictures of him on cameras, but we'd never seen him. And he was three and a half years old. He was a monster, beautiful buck at three and a half. He made it to four and a half. And I was going to try to, I was going to pass him up. If I ever had a chance, but lo and behold, we called him up and he's a, I estimated him 180 inch white tail deer and he's massive. He's just massive. And, uh, he's, he's, he's right up there. Anyway, um, we called him up and killed him and somebody from the company put something on social media about that deer. And so, uh, Mary was doing Facebook at the time and they goes, Will, have you seen, I just got a, a, a private post on Facebook, whatever that is. And she said, they just said, have you gone to the internet and see what they're saying about Will? And she said, no. So she went to the internet and she says, do you want to see this? And I said, what? And she read me one, one thing about how I had killed this deer in a pen. And oh, I had yeah. a, yeah. yeah, I had a, I had a pen and I would go catch deer in the big pen and put them in a five acre pen and then kill them. And I'm going, are you kidding me? Somebody needs a life. <laughs> and so that world gets bred by these people who have no life mm-hmm. in my opinion. And I want to stay away from that. So I got, I got, I know I'm talking a lot, but I got to tell you, that's so, the point. So I keep, I keep this on my desk. So I had a saying about, about discipline and about consistency. And, but I was at Sunday school one day and the Sunday school teacher, his son was a, a, a wounded uh, Iraq a veteran and his son made a statement and he, he repeated the statement to the Sunday school class. And I went, Oh my gosh, after Sunday school, I went to him and says, give me those exact words again. Cause that says what I've been saying, but a lot better. Discipline is simply turning down what I want now 
So later I can have what I want most. I keep this on one of my computer screens. It is so important. Wow. Let's say you want to lose weight. If you want to lose weight, you got to have just, so you got to turn down the chocolate milkshake. Now, if you, if you're going to get what you really want later, which is health and stamina. So you can apply that to so many areas of life. It's, it's unbelievable. Absolutely. It's talking about talking about people and about that internet and, and being associated with people that you ain't got no business being around. There are three kinds of people in the world. One kind of person is jealous of you. You start being a success, you're working hard. And next thing you know, they're talking, stabbing you behind your back. They're talking, they're jealous of you. The second kind of guy, he don't really care whether you make it or not. If you do great, if you don't great, but he's going to go about his life and doing whatever. And he's not going to have any interest in anything, but basically what he's doing and what's about him. Mm. The third kind of person wants you to win for no reason. No, no gain to them. They just want you to win. I, 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 I would rarely, rarely compliment myself. And I rarely, I tried never to use the word I or me or look what I did, but I'm going to tell you what, I want David Brinker to win. I want you to win. And, and when you surround yourself with people that want you to win, they share, they do things because, but because not because they have to, or not because they don't get anything back. It's because it's the right thing to do. do if you, I had an op- do, do, do you do you uh, with with the people? And obviously, social media accentuates this. It's it's a natural human reaction to be jealous and be spiteful and like I I've had friends that probably love me and want to want to be supportive, but they're so jealous it's just they can't get over that hump and it turns it turns toxic. So I've had to walk away from friendships. Um, what's your opinion on that? Like, as you made your way through life, you're, you're trailblazing, you're being extremely successful. Everybody, even though you're not drawing a paycheck, uh, everybody thinks you're rich and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're hunting behind fences and you have in these, <laughs> like they're making up all these fantasies to make themselves feel better about themselves. Yeah. And how did you navigate who was real and who wasn't and who, how did you surround yourself with? It's, it's hard to do that. It's hard to surround no, yourself it's, with people. It's simple. It's simple, simple, simple. You get around somebody and you watch them and you see how they operate. One day some guy said, I said, you need to trust that guy. He goes, how in the world do I do that? I said, learn to trust him. He said, no, but how do I do that? I said, trust him, trust him. And you'll find out real quick if you can trust him. Mm. those that one and two person i told you about you need to distance yourself from them they're going to bring you down find the people who want you to win and surround yourself with them Mm. and it's going to it'll it'll come around i mean it'll it's just amazing how it works but you got to trust people to find out if you can trust them that's really that's that's really powerful well i mean think about it you, 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 a guy, a guy, you're somewhere with a, a guy. I shoot a lot of sporting clays. Mm-hmm. Let's use this as an example. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm a competitive shooter. I shoot and I'm always prepared. That's where my, that's where my brain works. I'm, I've got my ducks in a row, but so-and-so walks up and meet him for the first time he's shooting. He goes, golly, I forgot my shells. I said, well, I got an extra case in the truck. Okay. Can I borrow them? Sure. I'll, I'll pay you back. Trust him. Give him the shells. See if, it, 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 that's the cheapest way to ever find out if you need to fool with him. Yeah. If he gives, if you paid you back, you, you, he's good. If he doesn't, you know, to stay away. <laughs> when you have a company of, what'd you say? 260 employees. Yeah. I think that's a, the total number. Uh, to, at, at ha, I mean, it's impossible to, 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 ha, to ha, I mean, no, no one's perfect first of all, but it's impossible nope. to not have toxic people. And I think when we, when I was down in Mississippi with you drinking, really good wine one night uh, <laughs> with, I, with a pinot or a cab <laughs> uh, i can't remember but I, I i remember it was really good and uh i i asked you because at the at that moment uh sitka gear which is where i was working you know we were still fairly small it's it's pretty big now but we were so pretty it's pretty small and uh i was asking you advice like hey you know there's a couple toxic people that i work around um how, how do you deal with that? How, how did you deal with conflict? How do you, I mean, you can't just fire everybody for, for being flawed, right? Uh, how, how does that no, work? But, but, well, 
I, if I could get out the performance reviews, there were three performance reviews. One for, for executives, one for middle management, and one for hourly. And each one was tailored to how you fit within the organization. And every organization needs so many chiefs. They need to be good chiefs. And then you, and then they're, 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 the, they're the people below that. They might want to become a chief. But if they want to become a chief by railroading and walking over and, and stabbing people in the back to get to where they want to go, you can recognize that. And you counsel them and you, you, you tell them where they need to go and you, you've got to, you got to move them on. And if uh, they don't? You got to move them on. Yeah. You got to tell them it's, this place is not for you. I remember one time I had two executives. They had offices next to each other. And they were not getting along at all. They were like, they're going to kill each other. One of them didn't trust the other one. The other one didn't trust the other one. And they would not work together. One was in product development and one was in marketing. They go hand in hand. And they couldn't even communicate. So I brought them in my office and I sat them down. I said, guys. I understand what's going on. I know y'all don't like each other. And I said, but here's the deal. Y'all figure it out and y'all have a time together and y'all find out how in the world can y'all learn to like each other and work together. And if you can't do it and you haven't done it within two weeks, I will fire both of you. It's just as simple as that. And I hated stuff like that. But if I wasn't a strong leader and I wasn't willing to do that, I am holding the whole company down, all 260 employees. I'm holding every one of them back because those people controlled a lot of the future of the company. Mm -hmm. I had to continue to grow to continue to take care of my, my, my staff. Mm -hmm. And if I couldn't do that, they can't take care of their families. They're going to go find somewhere else to work and I'm going to lose it. Mm -hmm. So how'd that work out? Uh, one of them left. Mm. Yeah, it seems like when you when you force people to work it out, it can get worked out pretty quick when their job's on the line, you know, because I mean, it and if you're working at a company, you oftentimes have to leave behind personal issues with people because it's almost impossible to be around that many people for that many hours a day under those stressful conditions with those big, dis you know, there's a lot going on. It's almost like living with somebody like I've, yeah. I've often thought of the office spaces like you're almost roommates 10 hours yep. a day. And yeah. you, you yeah. either figure it out or you don't, you know, and yeah. you have the choice. It's yeah. a, you, you can leave. Uh, but there's also times where it's, it's not fixable. And yeah. well, one, one another, one of the, one, another greatest book I ever read, it's called good to great mm -hmm. by Collins. And if you hadn't read it recently, read it again. If you hadn't read it at all, for sure, pick it up. It's an incredible documented story. He had to use public companies because to, to do this, this analysis because public companies' records are public. Private's not going to give you the information he was looking for to be able to make the analysis and to, and to have a hypothesis and to prove it or disprove it. He, wasn't, he wanted me to be able to do that. But, you know, he talks about the friendships and he talks about the relationships within an organization. And he talks about putting the right person on the bus, but the right person on the seat on the bus. Mm. And two examples, uh, there, I believe it was a tobacco company that was being studied, but th th this guy was fantastic. He was absolutely incredible. His division was knocking it through the roof. And the CEO chose the guy who was putting those kind of numbers on the table and put him in charge, I think of a, organization in Europe that was absolutely horrible, was worthless. And so some of his co-executives, the uh, next the, uh, the less than his CEO position, but they helped run the company, came to him and said, have you lost your mind? That's the best organization we got. He goes, listen, you put your greatest asset behind your greatest opportunity. And that's what he did. He put mm. the best, the guy who knew how to do it, and he turned that around and made it number one. Wow. So, and that, that, that's just, uh, that's just one story. Here's another story. I had a friend of mine who's one of those guys who wants you to win. His name is Ken Pope, Birmingham, Alabama. He had a lady working for him 
he called me. We visit every once in a while. He's a big John Maxwell fan, great innovative books, uh, motivational books, uh, business books, wonderful. And he was telling me, he said, this particular person is floundering. They are doing a horrible job, and I'm going to have to let them go. We talked, and I said, well, you know, this, this person, Ken, talk, told me one time about a personality analysis and how to utilize them. I had done some, but I said, well, what did her personality analysis, because he gives everybody in his company one. I said, so what did her, what did her personality analysis say? He says, you know, I, I looked at that. I'm going to give her another, uh, another test. He gave her another test and he found out she was on the wrong seat in the bus. That's what he theorized from the test. So he had an opening coming up for the head manager of all the office personnel, 60 people. He put her in that position and she rose to the top. Wow. Here he was fixing the fire, but she was in the wrong seat on the bus. Mm -hmm. So as a leader, as a manager, as somebody in charge of people's lives, you've got to be able to look at stuff like that. How, how did you, how, you talked a lot about not taking a salary and you went to that show and sold $1,800 worth of with calls. Uh, oftentimes the biggest hick or the biggest hurdle with being a, a founder or, you know, and going out on your own is capital, right? Yep. So uh, how did you make that work? How, did you, how, how do you not take a salary? By the skin of my teeth. Okay, so you're mixing up two things there. I'll kind of correct you. So okay. $1,800 sales I made. I was still in the restaurant business. I was still okay. working for the family. I had my game call company on the side. Mm -hmm. I would come home after night working, oh, make okay. game calls, get that together. And then I went to a show on, on, my, on my day off. It was on a weekend show. It was a Saturday and Sunday. I got off, and I went to that show. When I, when I quit the restaurants in 1988 and started – Doing nothing. Wait, but, so you did about 10 years both? Oh, yeah. I did that. Uh, yeah. Roughly. Can to cane. Can to cane. Yeah. <laughs> can to cane. Wow. Yeah. So you were yeah. like literally, for, I mean, hold on. When did Primo start? 1976. Six. So I had, you, my first, had my first dealer in 1976. 1976 to 1988. Yeah. You were working, you were building a company and working in a restaurant. That's right. And wow. so what I did, I found a guy who was going to college here. His name is Nathan Amsbury, a gift from God. And he ended up coming to work. He had a few classes during the, the week, but he could work most of the time. And I converted my house into the whole one room was the sales office. The outside garage was the manufacturing area, all that kind of stuff. Had a marketing room. Had, had, had hired a guy for marketing. I didn't pay myself anything, but he ran it during the day eventually. For about six years, it was nobody but me. In 1984, I think it was, I hired Jimmy Primos, my cousin. Mm -hmm. And and um, Jimmy was a Vietnam vet, uh, Marine, uh, had been trained in New York as a Merrill Lynch stockbroker, and he just wasn't happy. And uh, he came to work for me for $4 an hour. And we wow. built it. We built it. He ended up being the chief operating officer of the company, smart as a whip. He now has a gun store. Since we sold the company, he, he started a place called The Range by Jimmy Primo. Yeah. And he teaches, he teaches all the women in Madison County, Mississippi, how to defend themselves. That's basically going to be a bunch of dead husbands, I'm telling you. <laughs> these, women, these women are good. They're, he's teaching them all how to shoot. So when did you, when did you take your first paycheck, roughly? Um, I'm going to say that was probably – I had a – the company paid for my truck. And they paid for my health insurance, but I drew no salary. That was from 88 to 97, 97 or 98. Mary supported me. Whoa. Now you I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a choice. If you're not careful in business, you can grow yourself out of business. I'll never forget. I, wow. I went in to file my, my tax return. And it, I mean, my little game call company was like five years old or something. And yeah. I'm working in a restaurant and I'm meeting with a CPA and I can't do a dead gum tax return. He does all his figures and punches on his cash. And he says, well, congratulations. You made some money. <laughs> I went, I went, really? I said, where is it? Cause I didn't have no money. I'm barely making the check, but work. I said, where is it? And he said, it's in inventory and it's in receivables. Oh, and, and, uh, so 
at that point, I had to make a decision. Hire a collection agency because I had some dealers that weren't paying me that. I, it was a small time. I think I was doing $300,000 in sales back then. Mm -hmm. And so I, I couldn't afford that. I couldn't afford to advertise. And this is before I read Radical Marketing, which is this is not in the book, but it fits the Radical Marketing model. I decided that I would ship any dealer up to $1,000 any time they wanted it, when they wanted it, with no credit check. And if they didn't pay me, I wouldn't chase them. I wouldn't waste the time. I'd write it off to advertise. I had, very, I had very few stick me and it worked like a charm. Really? Yeah. I, I also learned, I learned this. I didn't think this up. I learned that consignment is horrible. Consignment is where you take the product into the store, you give it to them, they sell it and they pay you at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. I found out that does not work at all. And here's why you walk into the store. The owner there has got all this Primo's product. He didn't have to pay for it. He only's going to have to pay for it in the season, but he's got all this X, Y, Z brand. So he takes the consumer over there and says, these are the best brands. I got these if you want them, but these are the best. And he sells him the X, Y, Z stuff, not yours. He's got to have an incentive to sell it. Yeah. He has to have a hook. Wow. I, I'm, Blown away. I also remember you telling me, uh, and uh, when I was down there, that you even held off on buying a house. Oh yeah, for a long, long time. A long, long time. And e even something more personal, you, Not you, you made a decision. You made decisions to like. I want to talk about something real quick uh, around sacrifice and being able to do what you did. You had to make other sacrifices to not do other things, right? That's that's right. And, you know, I guess my first question would be, give, can you give a couple examples? And then the second question is, how do you de decide what you can sacrifice? Because no one can do everything. And I know a lot of my listeners, because I, I just naturally, because I'm so curious about entrepreneurship, uh, I have a lot of people that will be listening to this that are, that are wanting to, either they're stuck in something they hate, or they're young and they're just ambitious and they want to create something. How would you give them advice about sacrifice and that what did you specifically have to sacrifice to do what you did? Well, pretty much I had to sacrifice everything, but things have to work. You have to, you have to have something that allows you to know that you can make a decision work. And an example would be, I chose not to have a salary. Mary and I sat down and visited. We also decided we didn't have children. Mary had a first marriage. It didn't work. So it's our second marriage for both of us. We got married in 1990. So we sat down and we talked about it and we said, what about children? And I said, well, we ain't got nothing. And I, I don't want to end up in my retirement years and still having to be work. And I don't want you to have to remember telling you very specific. I don't want you to have to be waiting on tables. Because I've been around older ladies that were holding up big trays and waiting on tables, working for tips trying to make enough money to live at 65 years old. And we didn't want that. So we made a decision to try to plan for retirement and to work. And that she, she was making a, a big salary and was on commission plus, sal plus salary plus commission. She was doing real well. And we made a decision not to have children and made a decision that I would build a company. And she trusted me to build a company. Now I traveled. I remember one year I traveled 48, uh, weeks, 40, uh, some part of 48 weeks in a year. That's overdoing it. I was about to burn myself to the ground. This is before 9-11. This is, you didn't have to have an ID to get on the plane or nothing. We, uh, we flew, flew everywhere. And I can remember coming home, Mary picking me up and going, you do realize you leave tomorrow for <laughs> so-and-so. I went, oh gosh. I said, <laughs> she said, I've got a great supper. I've already got your clothes laid out for you. I think I've got what you want. You're going to do great. You're going to go over there and you're going, I was going to give a big talk, a uh, big seminar to, uh, I believe it was Kentucky National Wild Turkey Federation chapter, if I remember right. And she said, you're going to do great. And everything's going to be fine. And it's that kind of support. It's that kind of support system. And without that, you're not going to go very far. You're going to have to choose what you're going to do based on the support system that's being made available to you. 
And so, some people might have children already. They might have a wife that's not cooperative and she does not understand. And you're going to have to decide. And I do not, I don't believe in divorce. I didn't want, I didn't want to get divorced. It was the worst thing that ever happened. It's horrible. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't want anybody to have to go through that, but you're going to have to fit your lifestyle within the opportunities and the resources that you find available. Or you can decide you're going to plan way before all that, and you're going to try your best to make it work. Now, there's another book. <laughs> this, this book is called The Psychology of Money. And it may be one of the most impactful, most, most rewarding books that anybody ever reads. It's by Hauser, H-O-U-S-E-L. And in this book, he talks about money and what money means in one's life and how to navigate that world, especially for some people who get lots of it and don't know how to handle it. Mm. But the one thing that money affords you, and when I read this, I never really thought about why I felt like I never had any time. But when I read this, it just hit me with a sledgehammer. He said, having money affords you time. And I realized, oh, that makes sense. I don't have any time. I ain't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's just so practical and it's a wonderful understanding of how to go about saving and what saving in relationship to how much you make is and how to do it. So, you know, some people aren't willing to make the sacrifices they aren't willing they 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 haven't really figured out if they're passionate I, I i gave a talk oh seven years ago i believe it was um to the young biz, business christian so young christian businessmen's association a lot of young people coming out of college and so i talked to the guy that is in charge of that and you know he said wait we want you to give your testimony we want to talk about your faith in, in your lord and savior we want you to such on that, but we want you to give them some, some advice too about their lives. So I said, okay. So one thing I got up there, I said, okay, so how many of you are out of college? I don't know. 150 hands raised. It's probably 500 people there. 150, 150 kids raised their hands. I said, how many of you are still living at home? I don't know. They were less anxious to raise their hands because that's not really well thought of in some circles, but I would say, 30 people raised their hands. And I said, well, I imagine that some of y'all out there didn't want to raise your hands and understand why, but thank y'all for those that you did. But here's the deal. I was talking to a young man. One of y'all is sitting in the crowd before this started. And he asked me, he said, Will, you are so passionate and, and I want to find something that I can be passionate about. that I really want to do. I want to get up and go to work every day. I said, well, let me tell you what, that's the wrong way to think, buddy. If you're waiting to be passionate about something, good luck. I get to do something I like half of a day in a week or one hour a day at work if I'm lucky. I don't like firing people. I don't like having to interview people and turn them down. I don't like having to make all these business decisions. I don't like meeting with the bank. I don't like any of that, but it's all necessary for me to be able to have a business and do what I do. So when I get to go hunting and do something I really like and, and it takes my mind off all that other stuff, that's all good. I said, but let me tell you something. The relationships you made in college and the relationships you make at whatever job you choose, even if it's dig digging ditches, is going to pave the way for you. If you get hired to dig a ditch, and that's not what you want to do and you don't want to do it and you're scared of getting calluses and you're scared of getting blisters or whatever, go dig that ditch and dig it perfectly. Use tools somebody else didn't use. Use a laser to make sure it's perfectly straight. Do something to make sure it's perfectly depth, the right depth all the way down to the water flows, whatever it is that you're doing. I can promise you, if you keep doing that, somebody's going to recognize you and your commitment and your passion for doing the job right, regardless of what the job is. And then they're going to come to you and say, hey, Bob, I've got an opening um, in, in one of my businesses, and I think you'd be real good for that job. Would you mind to come interview for that? 
And all of a sudden you walk in there and this guy's got a hundred thousand dollar job for you doing so-and-so that you have never been trained to do, but the skills that you showed and the care that you showed in doing whatever job was at hand, right? Made all the difference in the world. And it opened the doors for you. I didn't want to go into the restaurant business. I really didn't. I didn't have a choice. I didn't think I did. I didn't know how to start. I didn't have an idea to make a game call company. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I went into the restaurant business and I had, I was one of the younger family members. So I got all the crappy shifts. I had to go to work at about nine 30 in the morning. I got off at one 30. I went back at four o'clock and I closed the restaurant at night. I had no life. It was, it was, it was hard. And it, it is hard being in that situation. Well, I'm leaving the restaurant trying to go home about 1.30 and in walks somebody that I know with his wife. His name is Warren Hood. Mr. Hood's gone to his reward. But they were coming in late. The kitchen was shutting down for the, the shift, getting ready to shift over, getting ready for night. I sat them down. They had just come in from somewhere and they wanted shrimp scampi. Never forget it. Went back there, got with the cook, said, let's open this back up. We'll, we'll take care of them. I stayed a little bit late and took care of them. Mr. Hood said, Will, I understand you love turkey hunt. Yes, sir. Well, I've got 18,000 acres here south of town. <laughs> and uh, I'd like for you to come turkey hunting with me. I said, Mr. Hood, I would love to do that. You just let me know when. Nope, I'm not going to call you. You call me when you want to come. And if it's available, you can come. Take you about 45 minutes to drive there from, from where you live. I said, okay. Mr. Hood was the largest industrialist in the Southeast. Hmm. He owned 400,000 acres of land. Whew. He was a high school educated boy. He bought some timber when he got out of high school, bought what's called a peck of wood sawmill where you drag the saw, the, the, the saw out there in the woods and you cut the timber right there and you take it to, the, to whoever you're going to sell it. Hmm. He hired somebody to run the Peckerwood sawmill, bought the timber. He ended up owning more companies. There's an incredible book written about him. And he's just, he ended up merging with Masonite. Masonite merged with Hood Industries and became, he became the largest owner, largest stockholder of Masonite Corporation. Wow. What's that book called? Um, it's not available uh, to buy, but it's, uh, I have to grab the, the book. Well, uh, text, text me later or something. I'd love to. Yeah. Love to hear more about that. So, yeah. So, so, but, but anyway, so anyway, he became a mentor. And I went down there and went hunting with him. And that was the last time I ever went. And that's where I recorded that tape, that audio tape with the oh, Swedish no way. Niagara recorder. That, that he opened his land. He said, You come anytime you want. Wow. So, because I went to work, because I had a work ethic and I knew I was going to have to work. And I was willing to help and do right and, and try. And I didn't always do perfect. But then one day at Sunday lunch, I'm waiting on this table. I know who this guy is. I never really had a whole lot to do with him. But uh, he called me over there and he goes, well, we got a lot of ducks and a, and a lot of deer. And I understand what you're trying to do with your little company. I want you to come over there and try to video a, a deer hunt. I went, this is probably 1988 or 89. Man's name was Bill Walker. Bill Walker owned 492 Bill's dollar stores. They were the precursor to Walmart. Wow. He owned 11,000 acres on the Mississippi River in, that joined all three states of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. I said, okay. So, uh, he said, I'm going to call you tomorrow. He called me. He says, well, I'm flying over there. He had a landing strip. He had jets, but he had uh, King Airs. He'd land on the grass. And he called me. He said, you come right, come fly with me. I said, Mr. Walker, I can't get off that quick. I, but but I might can come Monday. I can see if daddy will let me have a day off. I can come Monday. I drove over there, and he became a mentor. Hmm. Bill, Bill Walker was on, Mr. Hood was on Bill Walker's board. Hmm. These two people became mentors. The, the story, the reason I'm telling you this is you go to work and you meet people and you do the right thing. Hmm. And I don't care if they tell you to clean toilets. You make that toilet shine. 
Somebody's going to recognize it and the door's going to open. But that's the way you should carry your life. And that's what passion is. Passion isn't necessarily passionate about some individual thing. Mm. I, you've got passion in what you're doing right now. Mm. So the passion you have for the hunting world and for being there with that recurve and trying to call up that bull elk, it's transferred and is part of your life. Mm. And then the passion for raising your children and for, 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 for being good to your wife and, and, and caring about y'all's relationship. Mm. I mean, if you, I was part of this talk I'm writing, I, I, I'm telling the guy, I said, so if you want, if you want a good relationship with the Lord, maybe you ought to spend some time with him. I'm not talking about asking somebody else what they think, because there's a bunch of crazy wackos out there that can screw up your thinking in about two seconds. Mm. Ask the Lord to tell you what the Lord wants you to know. Spend time with him. If you want a good relationship with your wife, spend time with her. It's opening day of striper season or salmon season or whatever it is where you're living now. And you, you can go do that, but she's off and she's got a chance and the kids are going to be in school. I'm going to go do something special with my bride. Mm. And the relationship grows. And every time you do it, the, the benefit is exponentially greater than what you sacrificed. Yeah. What do you think? What was your... Uh, when you started out on this journey, and now you're 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 turning seventy this week. Congratulations, by the way. You look great. You're, you, <laughs> you, you, you. you keep yourself healthy, and that's that's a whole nother conversation. It is. That is. That, that is a discipline. Yeah. What was your goal, though? Like, what was you? You're making these sacrifices. You're deciding not to have kids. You're deciding not to take a salary. I think. Will, as you know, a lot of people when they start off in this entrepreneurial journey, and I, I mean, everybody falls into this. It's about the money. It's, I want to do this because I want to be rich or whatever. And even if they don't say it, I, I see it in their eyes. How much of it was about the, the financial, potential financial outcomes for you as opposed to the experiences or the people or whatever it was? I don't know. What motivated you and what was your... Your, your what, what what was your goal where you look back and be like that was a success? I, I don't know that I have the words or the ability to articulate uh, this answer, but I am going to try. I didn't have anything. Ideally, I wanted to be able to give back. I wanted I, I wanted to be able to share and do things for others financially not just with my time but, but but financially and i wanted to be able to retire or slow down and i had and i and, and mary and i talked about it. i said hon this is a gamble this is a gamble that we're going to be healthy enough to enjoy life when we get to that age and by that age i mean 65 plus and i i said i'm working to build the company, to sell it. And I remember her eyes, she goes, you're going to sell the company? I said, <laughs> when I get to that point. You, but you but you go, but in the process of, of going there, you make the decisions and you do the things you do because it brings you happiness and joy and return. Mm -hmm. And if you get there financially, and can help others along the way, great. And if you don't, that's okay too, because God's got a plan. And mm -hmm. you, if you don't believe that, then you're going to struggle with trying to help get yourself to make yourself do everything, and you can't do it. You just, you know, so lucky? Am I lucky? Yeah. Have I sold the company and, and, and made out financially? Yes. And I've continued to do so. And I got very, very lucky and found the right people to help me manage because I'm not a financial wizard. Help me manage finances. Um, I, I will say this. I built Primo's to sell it from mm. the very day I started it. And if an entrepreneur is starting a business, one of my biggest pieces of advice is to then stop, sit down, and realize, look in the mirror, 
Look at yourself, write it down, and realize every decision you make should be for selling the company. Because at some point, you're going to sell it. Or it's going to sell because you died, because you got killed, because you got too old. One way or another, it's going to happen. And if you plan for it, you'll be better in control of the process. You will have picked better trademarks, better names. You will have decided what can help you protect and build the legacy of the company, not your legacy, but the legacy of the company through patents. Um, I mentioned trademarks. Uh, and, and you can help other people along the way. And you can make them a part of the journey. Uh, and they can help you get to where you want to go. They may even do it. There's many people who've done it and taken a company public and, and, and made hundreds of millions, if not billions. And, but if it's all about money, I mean, read the story of Hewlett and Packer. I mean, golly, these guys, they didn't care about the money. They just cared about making a great product. I mean, they, could, they didn't even know how much money was in the bank. I mean, you'll find that those people who are all worried about nothing about the money, they'll never be happy and they'll be successful. Mm -hmm. How much is enough? Right. And and, and, and Housel talks about that in the psychology of money. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now that you're sitting where you are, do you have any regrets about those mindsets? Um, Or, I mean... All of, I don't us think ha- I- all, all of us have regrets, obviously, but I'm talking about like major ones. Would you do it different? Obviously, you've lived an amazing life that we can all be inspired by. I'm well, just wondering, like, I, what, what, I mean, what, are your, what are your main learnings that you can pass on to us youngins that are trying to sit where you are? Yeah. I'm, I'm humbled that you would it, you'd say that. I don't, re- I don't have any regrets. David, I think I'm very, very lucky um, in that I, I don't know. I didn't know any other way to do it. And I just kept trying to do it. But when you surround yourself with people that want you to win, when you're passionate about whatever you do in life, when, when you're willing to make a sacrifice because you want what discipline can give you later, what you what discipline can give you what you want most later, um, all these things become become part of your character and part of your self-image. I mean, there's another book. <laughs> I, I might have already mentioned it uh, on winning by, by Larry Basson. You got me. Uh, I have six months of books here for me at yeah. my, re- at okay. my reading level. So, so, <laughs> so w- w- with winning in mind, um, yep. so I'm reading this book with winning in mind by Larry Basson because I wanted to be better mentally at competitive uh, sport of shooting sporting clays. Once you learn the basics, you learn to handle a shotgun, you you understand what you can do, and you can break 75 or 80 out of 100 on a sporting clay course. But you want to be in the 90s, or you want to make 100, or you want to win. It's a mental game. Hmm. It becomes mental. It's no different than a lot of many, many other sports, golf or or baseball or whatever. And I'm winning. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this book because I want to learn the mental side of winning in this competition thing. And this guy, Larry Bassam, was the Olympic rifle champion. He used his mind to overcome things so he could perform better. He wrote this. Self-image and performance are always equal. Now, I'm reading this for a sporting clay deal. And I'm thinking, I'm reading this. Self-image and performance are always equal. To change your performance, you must first change your self-image. So, wow! in real estate, if you think it is like you to sell only one property a month, then you will do things to keep you, this is me writing, keep you in that comfort zone. You will do things that you're only going to sell one a month. You change your self-image to know you, you can and will sell three properties a month. And you will make steps to change your behavior, thinking positive thoughts to a self-image and performance of selling three properties a month. Change your self-image and you change your performance. So when you ask me about regrets and about what I do differently, you know, little did I know I had this self-image that I thought I could win. Mm. 
that I thought I could make it happen. Uh, so he puts it in words that I never really thought about before. The guy's pretty brilliant. Uh, I am aware that my performance and self-image are equal. I am eager to change my habits and attitudes to increase my performance. That's something you say to yourself. Mm -hmm. You can replace the self-image you have with the self-image you want, thereby permanently changing performance. I am responsible for changing my self-image. Nobody else is. I choose the habits and attitudes I want and cause my self-image to change accordingly. Self-image and performance are equal. Wow. Say it again. Excerpts from Winning with the Mind. To change your performance, you must change your self-image and elevate your comfort zone. Changing your self-image may be the most important skill you will ever learn. Wow. So that's powerful. Here is I'm reading. So reading, I can't emphasize enough how you, you need to you need to make a disciplined choice to find 30 minutes to an hour to read every day. When do you do it? In the morning or the evening? I usually do it in the morning. And I you do it, do you at, listen to it or do you actually read it? I actually read it. I like to hold a book and read it. Okay. And and I, and exercise is something that I finally found the time to do. Used to do, I'd be at work by six o'clock and I wouldn't leave till six or seven at night. So I'm, I'm always working. And, and that was probably not good. And I, I probably could have done that be much better. I sure I could. But now that I've got a little more time, I'm up early. I've started sleeping until five o'clock. I usually get up at 3.30. I can't believe I'm sleeping until five o'clock. But I'm getting up at five o'clock. I'm getting on a recumbent bike and I'm taking a book and putting it in my hand. Then I get on the elliptical every, about every th third day and do that as well. I'm usually spending about an hour on the bike because I have a little more time. But one reason I'm exercising more is I'm reading more. I get so interested in the book. I don't want to quit pedaling the bike while I'm reading. <laughs> you're 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 pedaling and reading at the same time. Yeah, I'm sitting on a recumbent bike. Yeah, and pedaling while I read. Okay. Okay. I just got, I just got one of those bikes and I've, I've been loving it. It's much easier on my body. Now, now, on, now, now if you got a Peloton kind or whatever that you're yeah, sitting up yeah. and you're getting it, you're, 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 you're yeah. just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing, you're just getting your heart rate up. I'm getting it up, but not, not like right. 130, 140. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Uh, we're going to wrap up soon. We're like, man, this is, I have so many questions. We're going to have to do this again sometime. Uh, okay. Why in the heck do you get up at 3.30 in the morning? What And what do you do? I know you don't need more, but I remember you telling me that when we were together, and I'm like, man, because I don't know what happened to my my physiology or my body, but if I don't get eight or nine hours of sleep, I'm just a worthless human. Um, okay, well, I go to bed early, David. I I, I, I'm, I'm, I was in bed last night at five minutes after eight. Uh, you, typically, I'm in bed by 7.30. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and Mary you typically goes to look, she, she lays in bed and, and watches a movie on her iPad. Typically we usually go to get in bed at the same time, but you know, you've got kids, so you've got to balance. You got to, mm -hmm. you got to look at the, you got to look at the resources and look at what life is what's around you. And you got to adjust yourself accordingly. Um, so I got up early when I did, because I had no other time for myself. Mm -hmm. None. So I got up early. I had a devotional. I, I spent time with my Lord and maker. And then I had a little bit of exercise back then. I, I had had breakfast and I'm gone because if I'm not disciplined about that, the day gets gone and I don't accomplish what needed to be accomplished for me to take care of what I felt like I needed to take care of to grow the business and to get to where I wanted to go. Well, you've been a, a very inspiring person to lots of people. Will, and uh, we all appreciate you blazing the path to give us all a better life. Um, and uh, for those that don't know much about you, um, all you got to do is Google Will Primos. I'm sure there's not very many, but very, very inspiring person, successful business men. We didn't even talk about hunting, even though we're both share the same passion for the outdoors and hunting. Uh, but maybe that's for another time. I, I, I really, I really enjoyed this conversation, Will, and, and thank you for taking the time to come on. Well, thank you for having me. You've, uh, your questions have encouraged me and I thank you. That's one of the things that all of us should do in life is, is encourage others. So thank you, David. Well, I appreciate you, buddy. I'm going to, we'll, we'll see you on the show soon. All right. Tell Rachel and the kids. I said, Hey, well, thanks for tuning into the altitude show today. Make sure to get out and support those that support the show. Gohunt.com, peaksequipment.com. Also, 
You can support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel or wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe there and leave a five-star review. Nothing less than five stars. We'll see you next week with a new guest. Have a great day, everyone.